2016. Time goes by quickly, doesn't it? All right, we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 6 tonight. Um, Colby, are you going back there with the youth? Okay. Rob, would you? Okay, you got Chana. Never mind, I got Chana. Thank you, Chana. Put the scriptures up for us. Anybody got a testimony you want to share before we get started? Maybe some good God has done for you? Yes, amen. Thank you, Alicia. Anybody else? I just want to thank the Lord for I, my wife and I just celebrated 43 years together. Yeah. I told her, man, it only seemed like 40, you know, how time goes by. Just saying. <laughs> It's been, been a good good journey, and God is so good to us. We're kind of belaboring the fact it's been 43 years, and, you know, it's a long time. I said, we got a long, long time ahead of us. Until the Lord comes, we're just going to continue to go on and do what God wants us to do. And the best is yet to come for all of us, for all of us. I believe 2016 is going to be a great year. I really do. In the spirit. You know, maybe the world may have some problems, but the church is going to do okay. You're going to do okay. So anyway, I want to thank you all, too, for your, your gifts that you, you know. I took my wife out last night. Was it last night? Yeah. Got off my diet and went to a cheesecake factory and just, just <laughs> did everything I shouldn't do, you know, eat. Just ate, man. It, it was good. Thank you for giving and, and, and blessing us. I really appreciate that. Okay, anybody else? All right. Last two weeks ago, if you were here, we talked about training for reigning and, and took the life of David and just kind of started with him, how God took him from absolutely no one, basically a shepherd boy, uh, to the greatest king Israel ever had. And that there was a real process that he went through to get to that place. And liken that to the same process that God really takes us through lessons that we have to learn from the time that we get saved until we reach our destiny or our, our goal, what God has for us, and, and all the provision that takes place along the way. And so we kind of kind of talked about and, and termed this training for reigning. So this is part two of that. It's going to be about three or four weeks when we want to look at this. But um, today I want to talk about the battle for integrity. Now last time we talked about David. The first thing that happened when, when he was anointed king he found a king to serve, and he went to Saul and, and said, I want to be your servant. I want to I want to just, you know, be your armor bearer. I want to help you out, and Saul allowed him to do that, and then the next time we see David is when he meets Goliath, and so he had a king that he had to serve, and then we find him facing a giant that he had to kill, and that giant wanted to take his head off, basically take away his destiny, take away his vision, his goal. And anytime we do something for the Lord or desire to do something for the Lord, we go through the same process. Um, we, we talk about how David learned his lessons, his first lesson in Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. The, the house of bread, we can liken that to the local church. That when we first you know, come to the Lord, we learn much here in the local church. Our lessons, our, our foundation is learned here. If we don't learn it here, uh, and do it right, later on down the road, it could become something that can destroy us. And so David had to learn some lessons in Bethlehem. We have to learn some lessons in the house of God. And the lessons we need to learn, the main lesson is this thing called integrity. And so we're going to talk about this battle for integrity. And we, we t I, I kind of introduced a little bit last two weeks ago how there's just three, three things that we have to deal with. One is a demonic activity. The other is a carnal nature, and the third is tradition. We're going to look at those three things here in just a moment. But the word integrity, it's an interesting word. 
that comes out of the Bible, it means to be the same thing on the outside as you are on the inside. Basically, what you see is what you get. You have one essence. Unfortunately, some people, Christians, are schizophrenic. They come to church, and they act like they're holy. They say all the right things. But Saturday night, you know, they're living for the devil. Monday, they go to work, and they live for the world. So Monday through Friday, they're living for the world. Saturday, living for the devil. And then on Sunday morning, they come and live for God. And, and that, kind of a, that kind of a mindset is, we can call it schizophrenic. The Bible calls it a double-minded person. In James 1.8, it says, he is a double-minded man, and he's unstable in all of his ways. So one of the first things that we have to get out of our, our life is that, that mindset that we can live for the world, we can live for the devil, and we can still live for God. Integrity is you are what you are, whether anybody's around you or the whole world is watching you. You're still the same person. And you serve the Lord. Hopefully, as a Christian, you serve the Lord, and you show that forth. And if you try to sandwich it between the world and the devil, then what's going to happen is the devil will tear you apart. And he'll literally just, just rip you to pieces. And that's what we're going to talk about. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, we're going to start our scripture reading. Paul tells us to put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and against the rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. The first giant is demonic influence. Demonic spirits. We, they've done a lot of research on this, especially in, in later years. In, in Christian, Christian psychology, they call it, or in deliverance ministry, or what have you, that a lot of what happens to us and what happens to children from the time the one-year-old to the time the seven-year-old that they are programmed a certain way that can allow for uh, demonic activity to take place. Not that they're demonic and, and demon-possessed, but th there can become a stronghold in their life. The things that are talked to them, things that are said to them, things they, they uh, occur in life, uh, sometimes through abuse, that, that it puts this, this stranglehold in their life that later on can really cause a lot of problems. And those demonic activities, things that can take place during that time need to be addressed somewhere along the line. And uh, these demons, they assault people to what the Bible calls imagination. In the King James, they call it imagination. And that's found in 2 Chronicles, or Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. And the word imagination means to set up an internal dialogue so that you will respond in a certain way when certain things occur. In the King James Bible, it says, cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. These imaginations are high things and need to be cast down. And the word imagination is the same word in the Greek that we get the word dialogue from. And it means basically words that were spoken to us, words that have influenced us, words that either created good things or bad things. But what happens is we see in children, and maybe what's happened in, in some of our lives, is when we were children, we were told certain things, and we grew up believing those things. If you had somebody of authority in your life, for example, that came along when you were a child and told you you were just a stupid kid, you're going to grow up thinking you're just a stupid kid. Or if somebody tells you you're not able to do certain things, you'll never achieve anything. You're going to grow up believing that, and so along the line, especially as you get older, you have a tendency to resort back to what you were told when you were young, and you don't know why you react the way you do. And, and, and what happens is the devil can come along, demons can come along, and they attach themselves to those words. And, and it's that big thing that gets in our mind, our imagination. It grows bigger and bigger and bigger, and pretty soon when, when we're faced with an opportunity, for example, as a Christian, to do something for the Lord, immediately in our mind we say, I can't do that. There's no way I can achieve that. Why? Because we were told years ago we couldn't achieve that. If somebody told you you're fat and you're ugly, you grew up believing you're fat and you're ugly. I, I saw a picture today of, of a woman 
she had written all over her face things people have said to her. Ugly, fat, you know. All these things she had on her face, she wrote her on, on her face because, and, I, and when I saw that, I thought about it, that's what she's thinking, that's what she's focusing on. And, and none of that is true. I mean, if she could just erase all that and put, I'm a beautiful person, and focus on that, she would see herself as a beautiful person. So words that have spoken, dialogue, imagination that's spoken to a person, especially when they're young, they grow up believing those things, and then when they get older, when certain uh, elements line up, we have a tendency to fall back on those things, believing that that's the way it is. Uh, put it into a different context. For example, boys are taught very young in life that they need to act a certain way around girls or around females. And um, sometimes the way they act is not very good. And they look at women as being something that, that's not wholesome, but they look at women as something that they can abuse or they can use or that it's something that they need to conquer. Uh, Job made a statement in Job 31.1. He said, I made a covenant with my eyes why then I shall I look upon a young woman? In other words, he made a commitment. He said, I'm not going to look at women in a lustful way. I'm not going to look at them in a wrong way. I'm going to look at them in a wholesome way. And so sometimes in our imaginations, if we're looking at people wrongly, those are things that need to be brought down. These are things that need to be cast down. Uh, in, our, in our society, of course, we've got commercials that sell everything on the basis of vain imagination, carnal appetites. Our media is set up to feed these imaginations all the time, and these things need to be brought down because we have a tendency to always want the latest and the greatest. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, he said, Our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Ungodly thought patterns, stimulus responses, Spiritual bonds have to be undone. So the question is, how is that done? If we're talking about something that, that could be demonic in its attack towards us, of course we can use the name of Jesus to, to cast those things down, but there's something else we can use as well, as well. And the Bible talks about it. It's right here. It's the Word of God. The Bible says this thing is sharp, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, and goes to the very soul and spirit. It separates the soul and the spirit. It separates a carnal man. From the spiritual man, the joint and the marrow, to the very thoughts and intents of the heart. If we can just get this word of God deep down into our soul, because it was a dialogue, it was a word that was spoken, or maybe many words that were spoken to us, that causes us to believe a certain way, react a certain way, then the word of God, when it gets into our spirit, it changes all that. We begin, begin to believe what the word of God says, and what God speaks to our heart. And, and, and if, if you look at you know what you've been told when you're young, for example, so you can't uh, accomplish anything and you're stupid and you can't achieve anything, you look at the Word of God and the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus. Who strengthens me? And it begins to cleanse us. It begins to separate that, that spirit from that soul and it begins to heal our lives. So the Word of God, the Bible says, it's alive, it's powerful, it's full of divine energy. The Word of God can get down to the very root problem, separate the soul and the spirit so if we bathe ourselves in the word of, of the God, then a change takes place. I like to think of it this way. That uh, because Paul said we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers, demonic influences. That demons are like rats. You know, you, you, can, you can eliminate rats. You can even put out traps and get rid of them all, right? But what is attracting a rat? Usually it's garbage. And if there's garbage there, you can eliminate all the rats you want, but if there's garbage is still there, more rats are going to come around. Rats are attracted to garbage. Demons are attracted to unclean thoughts. They're attracted to, to things that, you know, those vain imaginations the Bible talks about. In order to get rid of the demonic influence once and for all, change, get rid of the garbage. Get rid of the stuff that attracts the demonic influence in our life. And the Word of God is a thing that can do that. So there's, there's a demonic thing. We can overcome it through the word of God. Then there's a second thing, and that's a carnal nature. And the carnal nature is a giant, and it's more difficult to deal with than demons are because demons you can cast out, and the carnal nature you have to crucify. And none of us like to do that. 
Romans 7, 19, Paul made a statement. He said, for the good that I will do, I do not do, but the evil I will not do, that I practice. Now, we look at Paul's life, we like to think of him as what he was. He was a saint. And now he's saying, I'm wrestling with something. There's a, there's a war that's going on in my, in my life, and, and I want to do good things, but I do evil things. And what is that evil that he's talking about? There's really two different words in the Greek that talks about evil. One talks about the violent, uh, malicious, uh, set your heart to do evil and hurt somebody else type of, of, a, of a activity against somebody else. And the other one is this word that we talked about two weeks ago. Anybody remember that word? In the Greek, it's K-A-K-O-S, kakos. Remember that one? Because that's translated in the Spanish, and we do have people here tonight that speak Spanish, to kaka. And that's what it is. And that's what Paul was saying. He says, I want to do good, but yet there's something inside of me. And, and what he was saying was not that he was intentionally trying to be cruel to somebody else. He wasn't violent towards them. But just sometimes I fall back into that old lifestyle, that old activity. Sometimes what comes out of me is not purity, it's not sweetness. For example, when, uh, when you're talking to somebody and they say something that offend, or bothers you and you become offensive towards them and you just, all of a sudden you just blurt out all these words, you know, and, and you say things to them and towards them and, and then when it's all over you go and you kneel down and pray and say, God, forgive me for what I did because I offended that person I hurt that person. And it's okay to do that, but you know what the Bible says to do when you offend somebody? The Bible says go to that person and make it right. Well, our response is if I do that, that's going to bruise my ego and my pride, and it hurts to do that, right? Well, that's what crucifying the flesh is all about. It's when we have to take the step and we do things to make things right. And it's just our old nature that's coming out, that's overflowing in our life, and we have to deal with that by crucifying it, by making it right, doing what is right, making those offenses right, forgiving people, doing all these things. So that's the old carnal nature. It's hard to deal with, but the Bible says in James 5, 16, to confess your faults or your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you might be healed. And then there's a third giant we've got to deal with, and that's the giant of tradition. You guys know what the last seven, the, the seven last words of a dying church are? That's right. We've never done it that way before. We get stuck in our tradition. We don't want to change. We're comfortable in where we're at. If we're going to go on with the Lord, we have to be willing to go where Jesus leads us. Ephesians 5.14 says, Awake you that sleep and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. And he's not talking about people falling asleep physically or people who are dead. He's talking about people spiritually they are in a slumber. And sometimes it's really easy for us to get into our comfort zone. You know, we, we just go through life. We're comfortable doing what we're doing. We're comfortable maybe going to church, having our family, and, and we're enjoying our life. And then, but then God comes along and says, I want you to step out in faith and do something more. I want you to do something different. I want you to go out and, 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 you know, fulfill his commission for our life. And in order to do that, we have to step outside of our comfort zone. And none of us like to do that because we like to be asleep. But he says, if you really want to have the light of God, you have to step outside of your comfort zone. So there's only one force that is going to stop us from our destiny, from what God wants for us. The devil cannot stop us. The angels will not stop us. But we can stop ourselves from fulfilling the destiny God has for us by simply saying, I'm not going to do it. God's calling me to do something. I'm not going to do it. And that's getting stuck in our tradition. Now, we're going to switch over a little bit and look at David's giants. When we talk about the giants David faced, his first giant was not Goliath. We see, according to Scripture, that, that when, when he was walking to check out the army. You know, he was just a shepherd boy. And he comes up on the hill, he heard this giant Goliath out there, you know, yelling curse words towards Israel and speaking all kinds of profanity towards the God of Israel. And David's first, first giant, when he heard that, was his oldest brother, Eliab. Remember that? Because he walks up and he says, what's going on around here? We're going to look at that. It's over 1 Samuel chapter 17.
Now remember, Jesse was David's father. And he had word, heard word that Samuel, the prophet, was coming to his house to anoint a new king. And Samuel had se or Jesse had several children, and he lined them all up from the oldest to the youngest, except for David wasn't even there. And all these boys apparently knew that the Samuel was coming to anoint the king, and the oldest son was Eliab. And uh, he probably dressed his absolute best that he could, he probably looked his absolute best. He was a fine-looking young man, stood tall. And the Bible says when, when, um, when Samuel walked in and he saw the eldest son, in his heart he said, surely this is the one that's going to be the next king of Israel. But before he could anoint the boy, the Lord spoke to him and said, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Remember that? And he said, this is not the one. Next one, this is not the one. Went right on down the line, every single son. And then he finally asked Jesse, is there anybody else? He said, yeah, there's David. He's out here in the field. He's tending the sheep. He said, bring him in. And when he brought him in, the Lord spoke to him and said, he's the one. And he anointed him with oil. The least likely to be the next king, the youngest. Again, as I've said before, it's entirely possible that David was an illegitimate son. There's some evidence to that. And so he was, not even, he was not even considered. But here you have Eliab, who was the eldest. And, and in, in Israel's, in the Jewish tradition, the oldest firstborn son was called the crown prince anointed. He was the heir apparent. Now when the father died, the firstborn son received twice as much inheritance as any of the others. It was customary tradition that all the other children treated the eldest son like they would their own father. They honored him. They gave him, you know, first place. They knew that who he was, and that was a tradition he lived under. So when Samuel came and did not recognize Eliab, that was an insult to him. But God saw his heart. God saw his heart. And apparently there was something wrong with his heart. In 1 Samuel 17, 26, the Bible says, Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, the oldest brother, heard when, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab angers, Eliab's anger was aroused, and David against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left these few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Eliab basically said, I know what is in you, David. You are an inferior person. You are useless. You are a spoiled brat. I know your tricks. And in so saying, Eliab was really demonstrating what God saw in his heart. There was something wrong with this man's heart. They didn't trust God, and he didn't like his younger brother. And so even before David met Goliath, David's family, his traditional family, tried to stop his destiny. And David answered the challenge in verse 29. It says, And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? And then he turned from him towards another and said the same thing, and these people answered him as the first ones did. Is there not a cause? It's an interesting statement there. Basically, he was saying, is there not a word from God here? Is there not a principle here that overrides everything else that we're looking at? Because the tradition said Eliab should have put David in his place. But David said, I'm going to override tradition because there's a word from God here that overrides anything else, and that is this man who is cursing Israel has no right to do so. There's a principle that is higher than this is. And David said, I'm going to stand on the principle of the word of God, and I'm going to honor God even over the traditions that he was facing within his own family. So David broke the honor of family tradition when he questioned his brother. David was motivated by a higher principle. Look at verse 25 for a minute. 
Verse 25 says, So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. David's motivation was that he wanted to honor God, but he also had another motivation, that if he were to take out this giant, he would be introduced into the king's castle. He would be honored. He would be able to marry the king's daughter. He would become royalty. And he wouldn't have to pay taxes the rest of his life. Now the tax thing was worth it right there. <laughs> so he, he and, and you can look at that and you say, no, nah, maybe his motives weren't totally pure, but, but think about it. You know, remember one time when Peter came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, he said, we have given up our parents, mothers, and fathers, our houses, and our lands for the kingdom. What do we get in return? Jesus didn't rebuke him for asking that question. Jesus answered the question. He says, no man who has given up mothers and fathers and houses and lands will not be repaid in this life a hundredfold, plus eternal life. In other words, he told Peter, he says, if you follow me, if you do what I ask you to do, because I will bless you. I will take care of you. And sometimes in serving the Lord, we kind of push things aside. We say, I'm doing this all for the Lord, and we should be doing this all for the Lord. But we also should realize God is going to take care of us. God is going to bless us. God can enrich our lives. He can make our lives better. And I look back over my own life. You know, my wife and I have been married 43 years. I've been in the ministry now 38 years. I wouldn't trade it for anything. God has been very good to me. He has blessed me, and he continues to bless me. And I tell people all the time, I don't understand why he blesses me like he does, but he does. He just keeps more and more he pours into my life. And, and, and I just have to step back and, and answer that, that, that whole scenario in my life that David did. Maybe I should enjoy all the things God has for me. Why not? Why not enjoy the blessings of the Lord? Don't you want to have everything God has for you? Because it's more than just a financial end of it. It's a love you experience from people. It's, a, it's the family that you, you put around you as you grow up in, in, the, in the church. And, and all the things that God has for you, God wants to bless you. And so it was with David. He says, I'm going, I'm going to take a step of faith here. I'm going to just jump out because there's a principle involved here. And I'm going to be rewarded not only from God, but I'll be rewarded for this as well. So David had to feast the giant of his family. The next giant came. It's when he went back to Saul in verse 32 of chapter 17. It says, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail you because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. In verse 33, And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man from his youth. Anything will deflate you is when you go to your spiritual authority, your king, and he says, you're not capable of doing this. You're not capable of doing this. So right there, David had to make another decision. Am I going, what am I going to do about this? My own leader doesn't believe in me. What am I going to do about this? But his response is classic. Verse 36. It says, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. And so Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head, and he also clothed him with a coat of mail. And David fastened his sword to the armor, and he tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. And so David finally convinced Saul. He said, I killed a bear, I killed a lion, I can kill this Philistine. And Saul finally said, okay, if you can do it, go ahead. And then Saul said, wear my armor. And you all know the story. David said, you know, this thing doesn't even fit me right. I'm not used to this. And, 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 and here's, here's the key in that, is that even your spiritual authority, can only take you so far. But every single one of us have to fight our own battles in the way that the Lord has trained us to fight our battles. I can't do it, I can't do it the way that my pastor did. I can't do it the way 
you know, the people in my life who have, have influenced me, you know, I can't pray like they prayed. I remember one time when I was standing next to our pastor's wife, I just, you know, a teenager, and boy, she could pray a King James prayer. You ever hear a King James prayer? Boy, she was good at it. Man, she could pray, and I stood there and I thought, man, if I could pray like that, if only I could pray like that, God would hear me. If only I could pray like that, then I could see results in my life. Then I remember there was a young, there was a guy in the church. He was one of the elders in the church, and before every service, he'd have prayer time and go up the altar. And I'd just get right close to him because, man, that guy could shout and he could scream a prayer out like nobody I ever heard. And I thought, if only I could pray like that, God would hear me. But that's that wasn't my armor. I found out God can answer my prayers even when it's a very soft prayer, a very quiet prayer, a prayer of faith. So I I, I can't take on somebody else's weapon, somebody else's armor. I've got to find out what works for me. And every one of us, we've got to find out what it is that works for us. And so David realized his armor is not working for him, so he takes it off, and he gets what does work, and that's an old sling, and he goes down into the Kidron Valley, and he finds five stones. And he says, this works for me. It didn't look like much, but that's what he, he was comfortable with, and he had tested that, and it worked. And so again, every one of us, we need to find what works for us. And when David met Goliath, verse 44, look at this scripture carefully. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the fields. <clears throat> There's a spiritual, total spiritual message that is here. You understand that when one nation fought another nation back then, it wasn't just men fighting men. It was idols fighting idols. The God of one nation was fighting the God of another nation. And in this case, the God of the Philistines was coming against the Almighty God, the God of Israel, which wasn't even a match. But what this, this Philistine was saying, what this Goliath was saying, the giant, he was saying, in, in essence, he said, David, he said, the demonic forces that are behind me are going to eat you alive. They're going to tear you apart before this day is over, you're going to be destroyed. Now, if we think of it in that, that, that setting, he was talking about feeding David's carnal flesh to the flesh eaters or to the demonic spirits that were behind him. And truth be known, if David was coming against Goliath in the flesh and his own pride and his old eagle, he probably would have lost. But he wasn't coming in his flesh. He was coming in the spirit. Goliath didn't know that. He didn't understand that. But in the natural, if he'd have come to him in the, in the natural, he would have definitely had his carcass fed to the demonic spirits. And here's the point. There are way too many people in ministry today that are operating in the flesh and not in the spirit. And here's been my observation, and it's only my observation, that when people operate in the flesh, it attracts the wrong, wrong kind of crowd. You have people around you that they're not good for you, not good for the church. They're not good for the kingdom of God. It sparks some kind of feeding frenzy of flesh-eating demons, and they feed on the carnal nature of mankind, and all kinds of bad things, wicked things can happen within churches when that happens. And I want to give you something to think about. Remember when Jesus came to Peter? It's in Luke chapter 22. In verse 31, he said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Here's the question. Why didn't Jesus just rebuke Satan off of, the, off of Peter? Why did he say, I'm praying for you, Peter, that your faith becomes strong? Peter had to deal with his own flesh. And here's the thought. Just, just because this is, when I, when I was doing my study in college, this is what our professor laid out to us. Satan exists to destroy the flesh. He feeds off the flesh. If you take a spiritual person as pursuing God and trying to get all of God into, the, into their life and the word of God into their life, 
And they vary from that point, and they go back into the carnal life. If you saturate, saturate your spirit from your spiritual life to your carnal life, you're going to experience what hell really is like. It's going to be a sad thing. It's going to be a miserable thing. It's going to be a horrible thing. Because the devil feeds off the carnal nature. And if we're not walking the spirit, we're walking the carnal man, then the devil just comes and he does everything he can to try to hurt us. Hell on earth arrives when you lose your spiritual identity in your carnal nature. When we operate in the flesh, we'll become a feast for the demonic activity. Just like this man Goliath said to David. He says, I'm going to destroy you. The demons are going to destroy you. And David said, no, that's not going to happen. I said, today your carcass is going to fall. I'm going to take off your head because my God is greater than yours. We only win when we stay in the spiritual realm. We all face giants. David faced his giants. He called them out for what they were. He beheaded them while he was in Bethlehem, the house of bread. And we all face giants. We got demonic spirits we got to face. We got carnal nature we have to face. We have tradition that we have to face. But we have to face them. But the place to deal with them is where our brothers and our sisters and our family who are there to support us are within the local church. And what we... You know, the Bible talks about this. It says not to exalt or promote a novice because they can get puffed up with pride. And we've done this, unfortunately, in some cases in the church. We bring somebody in that's very talented and gifted, and they just get saved, and we push them out there into major mega-type ministry, and they just get annihilated. Why? Because they haven't dealt with things in their life. When we deal with things in our life on this level, then later on in life, we already have the victory. If we don't deal with them on this level, later on in life, they can become the thing that will tear us down. And that is why a lot of great ministries in the past have fallen. And people always come to me and say, how come this guy did that? You know, we thought he was such a wonderful spiritual man. They didn't deal with things early on in life. They didn't deal with things before they got out where the real pressure is. We have to deal with these things here. Take out the giants here. And then later on in life, we will have victory in our heart. So whatever your giant is, call it out, confess it, pray about it, and ask your family members, the church, to come around you and help you out that you might be able to overcome. And none of us should really be embarrassed by the fact that we still have stuff in our life the Bible calls caca. Because Paul said he had it. He said, well, I want to do what's right. I got this evil thing inside of me, this carnal nature. And constantly I'm in a fight with that thing. But confess your faults one to another that you might be healed. All right. Next time we're going to look at some other parts of David's life and how he goes from here to different levels and, and constantly dealing with things and overcoming things that he can be trained to become the man God wants him to be. And God wants us to learn things so we can become the people he wants us to be. It's a wonderful, wonderful life if we'll allow the Lord to do it for us. Amen? Amen. All right, we're going to stand. We're going to have a word of prayer. Who, need, who has any special requests? Anything we pray about? Any needs? What's his name? Kevin? Pray for Kevin. Sharon's mom, Eileen, is going in tomorrow for some, uh, some uh, what do they call that? Just, they're going to, it's not an angiogram, but they're going to put a thing up into her, her a what? No, but they're going to, they're doing this thing where they go up into the heart to see how if there's any damage. Yeah, camera deal. And th anyway, she's real nervous about it. <laughs> and um, I told her we'd pray for her. It's going to be like an all-day type of thing. She's, she's, trying, she's trying to stand on the word, you know, that God has already taken care of it, and we'll stand on the word with her. God's already taken care of her. Amen. Okay, anything else we can pray about? Susie?
they sold